Okay, so in a way, uh, what, I'm, what we're going to talk about now will build directly off of the previous lecture uh, about the relationship of good governance to um, economic development. But it's going to start at the other end of the spectrum. So instead of doing these, you know, big empirical cross-country uh, correlations of corruption versus growth and so forth. We're actually going to focus on one little <coughs> town on the border between Costa Rica and Nicaragua, not because this is necessarily typical of anything, but I do think that it illustrates uh, a lot of points about why it is that um, governance and institutions affect economic growth. But I think the other thing that hopefully it will do is give some insight uh, into strategies uh, by which you can actually change things. Uh, because a lot of times I think the economists sort of think, well, if you just have enough information about corruption and so forth, these problems will fix themselves. And it's usually a little bit more uh, difficult. And actually, I'm going to do another case on Gifford Pinchot and the US Forest Service uh, next week, which will be an American uh, uh, version of this, and I'm also going to do a lecture, I guess, on Tuesday about uh, which will be a more. I'm, I'm going to use all the principal agent stuff, you know, that, that Pascaline talked about, but uh, I'm going to um, give you a slightly different take on my view of, you know, how it is that you actually uh, manage a bureaucracy and get good results out of uh, government. So let's just start. Uh, any of you been to Costa Rica? No. Mm -hmm. Yes. No. Oh, okay. Good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Costa Rica is a very small country in Central America. You can see it here on this map, and uh, it's um, it's it's the most successful country in that part of the Americas, with the dubious exception of Panama. Panama does well because it's a money laundering center, and mm -hmm. you know they've got the canal <laughs> and all this stuff. But Costa Rica does well just on its own. And it does well both politically and economically. Uh, economically, as you saw in the case, which I assume you have all read, uh, it is an upper middle income country. So actually, the figure that was given in the case is a little out of date, but the latest per capita GDP figure is about eight nine $9,000 in, in parity purchasing power terms. So it it's really does well, and in fact, if you look at the list of exports, uh, it's actually become a manufacturing hub of sorts. So Intel and Boston Medical and a lot of big multinationals have actually put manufacturing plants uh, in Costa Rica. So it's not just a banana republic. It, it, it exports a lot of bananas and coffee and other tropical uh, commodity products, but they've actually begun to move up into uh, low-skill manufacturing um, uh, and the like. Uh, Politically, uh, I would say they've done even better because uh, it's kind of a miracle that in 1948 they had a almost civil war uh, between, you know, the whole region is divided up into, you know, an oligarchic class of conservatives and a more populist class of, of people on the left. Uh, and if you look at all the surrounding countries, Nicaragua, Hon well, not so much Honduras, but El Salvador, Guatemala, all of these countries went through just horrible uh, civil wars uh, during the, well, in El Salvador it started in the 1930s, but in the 1980s, uh, particular during the Reagan administration, Guatemala and El Salvador uh, and Nicaragua were all at the center of these very, very vicious wars which invited uh, external uh, involvement from the Soviet Union, from Cuba, from the United States, uh, and so forth. And the one haven from all of this was Costa Rica, uh, which after its civil war in 1948 actually established a new constitution uh, and it actually banned <laughs> an army. I mean, the constitution does not provide for an army. They have an internal police. Uh, the army in Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, Nicaragua, in all of these countries has been an instrument of authoritarian uh, repression. And in Guatemala, I mean, it was particularly nasty. About 400,000 largely indigenous peasants got killed uh, in the course of their civil war. Uh, and a lot of those people that were responsible for it, you know, they just tried to put one of them on trial 
uh, General Rios Mont, uh, and his conviction was, you know, he was convicted, and then the conviction was overturned by a superior court. So these are really tough countries to operate in. Uh, but Costa Rica is kind of a miracle because they've got a strong court system, they don't have an army, they have not had this highly polarized uh, fight between uh, the left and the right, between the rich and the poor. Uh, it's economically uh, much, you know, they, they said that the difference between Costa Rica and its neighbor to the north, Nicaragua, is the same or it's greater than the difference between the U.S. and Mexico in terms of the relative uh, uh, standing. Uh, Nicaragua, uh, as you could gather from the case, is much, much more troubled. You know, they had this big civil war with the Sandinistas and then they fell from power. There's a democratic government. Right now the Sandinistas are back in power. They're not the old kind of left-wing, strident left-wing party, but it's really a corrupt country. And essentially Daniel Ortega, the president of Nicaragua, runs this gigantic you know, patronage machine. So across the board, there's a really big difference between these two countries. So now, if we zoom in a little bit, whoops, <laughs> whoa, too far. Go back, go back. <laughs> okay, so that is actually not the isthmus. That uh, body of water on the upper part of the map is Lake Nicaragua, and the Pacific is down there. And that little A points to this town of Peñas Blancas, uh, which is the border post between Nicaragua. Highway 1, this is the Pan American Highway that, in theory, stretches all the way from Canada to Tierra del Fuego, although it actually, it stops in Panama. And I believe that you cannot get from Panama to Colombia on that highway because <laughs> the jungle's just too bad there, <laughs> right? So. It's never going to happen. Hmm? It's never going to happen. Yeah. It's never going to happen, right? There. <laughs> oh, yeah? It's, yeah. A, it's, a rich, it's a rich jungle there. It's very rich in biodiversity, yeah. uh, animals and plants, and we as a country will never let to do something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so this is what this, uh, what this case is about. And the question is, uh, first of all, um, there's a problem at the border. And I would say customs uh, in general uh, is a universally difficult problem because it is probably the principal source of corruption uh, in governments all over the world. Uh, and in fact, in Indonesia, <laughs> Uh, under Suharto in the 1960s, it was such a big problem that they actually outsourced their entire customs collection to a Swiss company. Uh, and they would not inspect the containers coming into Indonesia in Indonesia because all of the customs inspectors were too corrupt. And so they'd inspect them, you know, in Singapore or somewhere else. They'd seal the containers and they just ship them into Indonesia. And no Indonesian official actually could get their hands on this. <laughs> Uh, by the way, they had to undo this because there was so much kind of pressure from, you know, from the customs collectors that were out of jobs that they ha actually took, the, took that away from the Swiss company. And so now they've gone back to a fairly corrupt system. But, but I'm sure every one of you has, you know, can recognize that this is really a big problem <coughs> in, in, in virtually all countries. By the way, why is it that <clears throat> customs in particular, these border crossings are so susceptible to corruption. And by the way, I, I like Fernando's last <clears throat> question about is corruption the only, is, is the absence of corruption the only measure of good governance? And my answer is a resounding no. I'll explain next week why I think that's the case. But just for the time being, you know, we're, we're going to focus on this. So why is customs in particular so susceptible to public corruption? You, you have um, uh, people who are, aren't paid so much who inspect goods that are very yeah, valuable. Although, but that's true of the whole public sector. It's police and everybody else. But why customs in particular? Because they're, they they're have a lot the of gatekeepers. Yeah. They're the, the gatekeepers and money, there's, they deal with business directly. there's a lot of money, right? Mm. right? There's a lot of money. Power ranking All of these goods are coming across the border. Direct, right? direct access to the money. Yeah. And <laughs> then... And Most if they countries. pass the border, then they're free to go wherever they want, especially for drugs and everything. So just like you pass the customs and then it's fine. Right. A lot of demand. Hmm? Limited time and no accountability. Yeah. So you have and then, and how does customs corruption usually work? Like, so 
you're an importer because and... Because it's two country, you know? Mm -hmm. We have two different law regulations. Yeah, well, actually, in a lot of places, you get corruption on both sides of the border. Yes. But let's say you're an importer and you're, you know, you want to bring in a whole bunch of containers of, you know, machine tools from Switzerland or something. So how, do you, how does the actual process of corruption need all? Well, m mostly if it's high, if there's a high tax on imports, so just the basic and how they evaluate the value yeah, of yeah. the goods, okay. that's, that's a big you right. So de decrease the like cost and to pay the bribe to the like yeah. customs. Yeah, okay, so it's pretty straightforward. So most countries charge some kind of a customs duty. Uh, the customs agent will say to the <coughs> importer, look, I will charge you a lower amount of money if you give it to me privately and I'll give you some of it back, right? And mm. Both of them are better off, but the public treasury is worse off because yeah. they lose the money that they should have been collecting in customs revenues. And a lot of governments, especially in poor countries, a, a large part of their revenues actually come from customs. They don't collect mm -hmm. income taxes or corporate uh, taxes. They, they, they get it through this kind of thing. This was true in the US in the 19th century uh, as well. So this is a problem that's particularly susceptible. So mm -hmm. let's further talk about this particular border post. So what did the case say about why uh, this is a problem uh, in economic growth terms? Like what, what, what's the disadvantage that both Co Costa Rica and Nicaragua suffer from as a result of the, you know, these backups, these, you know, multi-day backups of trucks going across this border? So why would solving this problem help? Yeah, Gina. Because it has a, a higher uh Inefficiency. Inef 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 uh, that affects, for example, the revenues that then the country is going to get, or the uh, composition on mm -hmm. the on the import exports. Uh, okay, goods. so let's talk very specifically. Yes, so world beverage oh. should be like a fifty, n no less than fifty percent, and here is like uh, we have only. 50 percent mm -hmm. okay okay because it makes business very expensive and mm -hmm. uh, business people very uncompetitive in the okay region. let's talk very specifically like there is one sector in particular that's really badly hit mm -hmm. by this right? they perishable goods? it was perishable goods perishable, perishable goods perishable. and perishable. the reason is that you know these trucks are waiting at the border um, uh, if you've got milk or vegetables yeah. or Fish. bananas or something uh, you got to refrigerate them. That costs extra money. You got to pay. And how are the drivers paid, by the way? Mm -hmm. by, the hour. by the hour, right? And so actually, the drivers don't have an incentive to get through the post quickly because they're just going to get paid regardless of whether they, you know. It they means there is no infrastructure there yeah. also. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, so clearly, exporters, Costa Rican exporters, would do a lot uh, uh, better. Who else does better if you could free up transit across this border? The companies itself. Yeah, the companies and exporters. exporters. Just importers. exporters? What about importers. things coming in from Nicaragua? And the people, markets. Yeah, consumers, right? Yeah. I mean, consumers also would have access to stuff that the Nicaraguans have to sell to them. Yeah, they uh, they would get it cheaper if it could come across the border more quickly. And so this particular bottleneck with all these trucks stopping uh, <laughs> with no bathrooms and you know no facilities and everything it imposes a big cost on a lot of different uh, uh, economic uh, players in, uh, in in actually really in, in on both sides of the border okay so so the question then is <laughs> so this is the problem with a lot of the economists in in my humble opinion economist analysis with this stuff so if you take a standard microeconomics you know, course and you learn about price theory, they'll say, well, free trade you know, is, um, uh, you know, it maximizes uh, welfare uh, across the board uh, because there are gains to trade. It's Pareto optimal, meaning everybody gains and you know, no one loses if you move to this uh, uh, Pareto optimum. And this is probably one of the you know, most basic findings that of trade theory that you learn when you take basic economics, right? So everybody is better off if you have this kind of open trade. And you can certainly see in very real terms, if these trucks didn't have to wait at the border here, you know, you, you, you can see clear benefits, all right? So the real question is, if this is so blindingly obviously a good thing to do, why doesn't it happen? You know, why isn't this problem fixed? 
Anyone have any? Because they were afraid of Nicaragua's situation. I'm sorry? It involves too many stakeholders. I mean, it is, it is, it has to be uh, like a range from each side, both sides, the public and the private sector, the local community. Okay. It's like you cut the But we just off. said, but the, didn't the economic theory tell us that everybody's going to benefit from no. freer no, trade? No, no. Yeah. But, but, but the, investment, right. the initial investment is not uh, maybe there. Yeah, okay. So also, it's, it's a, like cartel uncle out there. And both like uh, mm, states are benefiting something from there. Mm -hmm. And they try and solve without understanding the problem. Anything that they do mm -hmm. is shallow. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Uh, and the, the problem is uh, much bigger than uh, Costa Rica. It also uh, involves uh, the next country. And even if they fix their sort of the problem, still the bottleneck will just continue on the other side. Mm -hmm. And they have this political problem. With they got this countries. political problem dealing with Nicaragua, yes, right? Which yes. is uh, which and is maybe also the populism also is <laughs> involved there because okay. they have a recent in 2010. Okay, good. As I so did. everybody's jumping way ahead to the political variables, which is actually what I wanted <laughs> to focus on. Uh, but let's let's just back up a little bit. But let's just talk about first uh, the World Bank and the uh, Inter American Development yeah. Bank both did studies. They both made. Uh, recommendations and so just in practical terms so you're Fernando Ocampo you're the Minister of Commerce in Costa Rica right so you've got certain things under your control but you work for the president who is Laura uh, Chinchilla who is actually still the president of, of Costa Rica she's actually politically been doing better since uh, since this case was written uh, but you know this could actually be a big boon to her because if you can free up this border post, you can increase the rate of growth, you know, people get richer and so forth. So she's presumably got a, an incentive to try to fix this problem, all right, as a politician. Uh, and he's designated as the minister that's going to try, to try to fix it. So I'm hoping that down the road, many of you will be ministers in governments, democratic, clean, <laughs> transparent governments, you know, down the road in a few years. So you should listen carefully because this may be an example of something that, uh, you know, kind of problem that you're going to uh, face. So let's just talk about kind of the, the technical side of the problem. So what actually needs to be done to fix this border to make it actually a, an efficient, like if you've ever traveled between Tijuana and San Diego, mm -hmm. uh, it's actually amazing because hundreds of thousands of people cross that border every single day in both directions. In fact, a lot of people live in Tijuana and work in San Diego and vice versa. And so they have these, you know, these what they call millennium lanes where you can zip through that border despite all the drugs and everything else, you know, in about 10 minutes, all right? So in order to make this, this place look a little bit more like San Diego, just technically what has to be done? Uh, the first of all, from the policy side, it should be like a clear policy procedures for the custom okay. like policy makers and also to, I think, to minimize the like a, uh, custom pressure to the private sector or okay. whatever. So let's talk about some of those procedures. So what are some of the actual things that hold things up there? Red tape, a lot of red tape. Just you know, streamline the, the yeah. Yes. Streamline. Okay, so um, there is a big problem in processing documents. Mm -hmm. Does anyone remember what the problem was? They don't they go up and down with the yeah. papers, yeah. so you have, have to do it on site. They so don't pay on site. Some people think ahead and they try to process all the documents yeah. before yeah. they yeah. leave San Jose, but others, you know, kind of wait till the last minute. And actually, what does it say? I mean, does it give you any benefit to no, actually? No, they are rewarded. They all stay in the same yeah, line. Yeah, because everybody's stuck in, you know, in a truck. And so they can't, you know, so even if you've done your homework, it doesn't actually help you. And it creates this whole secondary industry of people that help, you know, process at the last minute uh, your, your orders. And so, so what are some of the procedural changes that you would want to make just in? Actions. Okay. Do it in e Everybody does it in advance. Okay, well, so there's various things, right? So. Inspections. Is, is Clear procedures, good? yeah. Uh, how about I just with the documents? Technological Apparently solutions. Go paperless. Paperless, yeah. Okay, so you could computerize. Uh, Innovations or something. 
one window project. Coordination of, of four functions. Yeah, okay. Uh, right, so there's many different agencies, yes. right, on the cost, even on the cost recon side. Um, and, and they don't coordinate terribly well with one another. So one minimize the pl player thing, yeah. Coordination. What about the uh, physical infrastructure there? Roads right. need to be expanded. Okay, so. Expand. Okay, and one of the things they're saying is that there's only one two-lane highway there, yeah. and so everybody's stuck on the same road, and if you've processed your documents, you can't speed by the way you can in San Diego. You know, you still have to, to wait there, and wait. so if they simply widen the highway, that'll have an effect. What about other kinds of facilities? They should also uh, expand working hours because they wouldn't uh, overlap Seven with days. business. Yeah, okay, well actually, so they said that in terms of the customs post, how, how many hours a week is that open? Weekdays. Weekdays. No, no. It, it's open seven days a week, you know. Yeah. The, the actual government offices. 6 a.m. to 12. Yeah. yeah, I mean they're open, you know. You can't do it in the three in the morning, but but they're open seven days a week. So what's the holdup in the with brokers. banks and the, the, brokers. Brokers. Yeah. the customs the brokers. brokers, right? The private, so there's this whole industry that's grown up uh, to facilitate. So because this system is so inefficient, there's a whole industry that's grown up to facilitate people getting through. So it's, it's kind of like the discussion in the last session. You know, someone was saying, well, actually, isn't bribery a good thing because it'll actually speed things up? And so in a, in a sense, this is what these customs brokers are doing. Mm -hmm. Such an inefficient system that the truckers need help from somebody, so they pay a private agent to run their papers, and maybe they have to pay bribes to officials in order to get the papers back quickly, uh, and so forth, right? So uh, there's that, and then they said the customs brokers, they're the ones that aren't open on the weekend, right? So exactly. if, if you show up <laughs> on a Saturday night, uh, the the Actual customs inspection place may be open, but the private uh, uh, facilitators aren't, and so you still got to wait there until uh, Monday, Monday morning, right? So that's all uh, horribly inefficient. What about facilities? Bathroom. No facilities, and so you probably need building inspection facilities. Right. So, for example, you've got perishable goods. You could have refrigerated <coughs> warehouses. You could have places to store your stuff if you can't get your, uh, if you can't get your goods through, but mm. none of that infrastructure exists. And in fact, they don't even seem to have hotels or right. you know, other yeah. things for the truckers so that they can stop if they don't want to actually have to wait online, right? So all of this uh, constitutes kind of a technical set of solutions, right, that, that needs to be done. So what's the estimate so we're talking about why doesn't this just get done you know, right away? Cost. And somebody mentioned cost, all right? So does anyone remember from the case how much fixing all this stuff is gonna cost? 16, 16 million. million. Uh, it's for Hulu. Costa Rica, but it, it will take uh, somewhere 37 million to yeah. 47 million okay, dollars so from good. The both sides. So the... The budget of Mr. Ocampo is $16 million, right? Uh, and that's basically just the road widening and, and other stuff. But the IDB comes in and says that's what, 36 to 47 million, okay? And the government in the current budget doesn't have the money even to pay the six, uh, the 16 million, only gave uh, three million. Uh, but the IDB, IDB is willing to front the money to do this much more ambitious project. Loans. Okay, uh, just initially, is that a good thing necessarily? I mean, so you got this development bank that's offering you probably a below market interest Why rate. Why not? No. Because no not a good. Yeah. They, they also have to have like a public-private partnership action plan there and attract investors or private sectors there to build the facilities or infrastructure yeah. or somewhere. And furthermore, supposing that Costa Rica actually takes out this loan, let's say for $40 million, and they do all this upgrading of the physical infrastructure, does that guarantee that they're actually going to? No. 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 So why not? No. What's the, the problem? It depends on the, 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 the political. Come, come back. 
Yeah, and, and, and you don't know that because what are some of the remaining uncertainties that aren't going to be Negotiate fixed? Negotiate with Nicole. Hmm? Yeah. 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 yeah, okay, so the really so big no. question is, you know, they can fix everything on the Costa Rican side of the border, but if the Nicaraguans don't fix their side, mm -hmm. it's not going to matter because all the trucks are still going to be backed up, right? And so yeah, they need cross-border, like, uh, information about what is turnover from the both countries and to want to yeah. miracle, like, uh, <coughs> uh, to compare these uh, indicators. What's benefits yeah, but, but even if they did that, receive, yeah. even if they did that, the thing is that if you did all this stuff as a Costa Rican government and the Nicaraguans don't do anything, actually you may be worse off because, not just because you'll have spent the money and you'll owe $40 million to the IDB, but you all of the corruption that. may just, I mean, a lot of those revenues may just go across the border to the Nicaraguan officials, right? So you've speeded up things, but they've still got this whole infrastructure on their side that is taking payments and, and, you know, slowing things down and so forth. But, but I think yeah. that, uh, for example, uh, if uh, they do this alone, maybe it gives to the incentives to the Nicaraguan side mm -hmm. that they Thanks. also have to yeah. have such okay. kind of procedures and the transparency there. But so definitely, you if you are Mr. Ocampo yeah. and you're considering uh, accepting this offer from the IDB, one of the things you've got to really assure yourself is about is whether you can get leverage over the Nicaraguan government and you can come up with a common plan. And actually, from the IDB standpoint, it doesn't make sense just to give this loan to Costa Rica, you know, the best run government in Central America. I mean, they really ought to be extending a similar kind of offer, in fact, more money to, you know, to Nicaragua to fix their side of it. Yeah, but there is a window of opportunity because Sergio on the web, Nicaragua has had fiscal deficit for the last five years of around 200 million pesos, uh, dollars. So if you come uh, uh, to, you come and you talk to the Nicaraguans, you might have a chance to to deal with their interests of raising more money. Yeah. IDB plays a key role in the finances of Nicaragua since mm -hmm. many years ago. So and that's why you have a lot of leverage. You've got leverage. IDB in order to convince the Nicaraguans that are interested not only in the infrastructure for this project, yeah. but also in the money for education, for fiscal deficit, yeah. and for that. Yeah, and but, but if the Nicaraguans say, okay, yes, we agree, we think this is a good project, we're going to go ahead and do it, do you necessarily trust them? No. Yes, because you have okay. internationals guaranteeing that. You no. have international bank, you it have World be. Bank, and they have good pre pressure Well, but can the IDB, using all of this leverage, actually force Nicaragua to fix all so. of these problems? No. No. Because Nicaragua should be having like budget problems. They would never. I don't know. These banks have been trying to fix Nicaragua <laughs> for a long time. And, uh, you know, they haven't had all that much success. All right. Uh, so let, let's put this question aside for the time being, because obviously uh, you cannot treat, you know, $40 million as free money. Someone's going to have to pay that back exactly. at, at some point. And you've got to do this internal calculation. Is the increase, I mean, just from a public finance point of view, is trade over this border going to increase to such a point that increased customs revenue collection will cover you know, the cost of this loan and allow you to pay it back? Even if it doesn't, you can still justify it as a kind of public good and, and so forth. But you know, you've got to be careful about this because developing countries are really good at overextending themselves in, in loans um, from international uh, institutions. All right, so let's move on to the next set of questions. So the, the case study uh, was written by one of my colleagues who uh, conveniently gave you a list of stakeholders, but let's try to identify that. So let's just talk about the economic interests in Costa Rica that are affected by this, this border. So we said that consumers, exporters, Businessmen, okay. companies. So you have consumers, business community, exporters, Exporters business community. Importers. Someone said, who said business community? Okay, so is it true that the whole business community no, brokers would no. be uh, resist this? There is brokers a part of would the resist community benefits. benefits yeah. yeah, so exporters actually, let's. <coughs> Maybe so obviously the local businesses that are dependent on the inefficiency of the system are going to yeah. oppose it. So you have 
local, but maybe market is monopolized by them. Yes, I guess. No uh, competition. But, but, but let's go back to San Jose and you know all the companies that are located there. Is that whole business community necessarily in favor of doing no. this? No, brokerages would be. Brokers no, the broker. No, the brokers are up at the border. But but I'm talking about, you know, let's say you're, uh, you know, you're you're just producing bananas or something in, uh, or I don't know, toiletries or toothpaste or something in in San Jose. Yeah. Are you necessarily in favor of this? Those who, uh, those who don't, don't those trade, those yeah. who are not involved in international trade might not favor this. Yeah, but like local producers. But local producers. Why would a local producer not favor? Because they would no have to compete more companies. with cheaper yeah. products. Yeah. Right. No, exactly. So this is the point, right? So if you open the border, the trade is going to go in both directions. And so your exporters will do well. But a lot of um, importers, well, Let's say people local hurt, producers, by, yeah. hurt by competition. competition. Yeah. Okay. Non-competitive market. So maybe Nicaragua actually produces, you know, mangoes or something, and they can do it much cheaper than producers in yeah. Costa Rica. So they actually are glad that the the border doesn't work very well, right? Not only them. Uh, and, and there is also the CA4 that yeah. is coming by the Pan American Highway. Yeah, okay, so explain, explain why they, that creates a problem for Costa Rica. Because um, Costa Rica is dealing bilaterally with different neighbors mm -hmm. and do not like to reach an agreement like a free, zone, free trade zone with the entire region. Mm -hmm. It prefers to deal bilaterally with each one of them. And some countries up north are reaching an agreement that is CA4, it's, not, it's widely known like that and even with Mexico afterwards. Mm -hmm. So if you open that border, it's not gonna be only in Nicaragua, but it's gonna, all the trade coming from the Five north is gonna yeah. enter through that border. Yeah, right, so, yeah, so there's Politica. the potential for actually quite a lot of competition for some domestic business interests here, right? Yeah. Uh, and then furthermore, you know, some of those other countries may not want trade diverted from them, and they, you know, they may have if they if they've got allies in in Costa Rica, they may encourage them, you know, not to uh, not to open things up. Um, let's talk about so these are mostly private sector players so far that we're talked about. So let's talk about the government. Okay, mm -hmm. first of all, what is the Costa Rican government? So let's um, actually let's just list all of the different agencies. So we got Ministry of Finance, Customs. Health officials. Health. What else? Health. Ministry of Health, Police. Minister of Agriculture, Police, Immigration Police. Office. Police, Minister of Health, Health, Health. Agriculture. Agriculture. Agriculture, Immigration, Immigration, Transport. Immigration, Transport. Okay. So let's talk about these as separate agencies. Which of these groups has an interest in a more efficient border mm -hmm. operation? How about, what about the customs? They, yeah. don't, they don't. They don't want it to change. Depends. Less corruption. <laughs> yeah, okay, so for the reasons we talked about, I mean, it could be that back in San Jose, there's a ministry of, you know, I don't know, revenue or something that controls, in theory, the corruption, I mean, I'm sorry, controls the behavior of the local customs agents. No. But, no. And, and they may want to maximize the amount of customs duty that they collect, but may, they may not be able to control the local agents, right? Because they're way up in, you know, this is a pretty remote part of Costa Rica, and they may yes. not be able to police them, uh, and so forth. And so customs is, you know, probably on the whole going to be opposed to this? Certainly all the people on the ground. What about the police? Same. Why? Because of drugs and other issues they have from those countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And immigration. Yeah, Same although mm -hmm. it could be that if you have better computers and more resources, you know, put into that area, they might be able to do their job a little bit better. But on the other hand, uh, this is similar with immigration, you know. What about the immigration authorities? I mean, if you open up the border, you're going to get more immigrants, right? Because you're a wealthier country as well. 
Yeah, yeah. so a lot of people are yeah. migrating yeah. from other parts of Central America. Uh, and so that's going to increase the burdens on them, and the government doesn't increase their budget, and so they're now going to face, you know, having to deal with twice as many immigrants. They're probably not that happy. The police, you know, we really, we really don't there know. There is the issue of crime in Nicaragua is a high level of the yeah, crime. Yeah, definitely. So um, Honduras actually now has the highest crime rate of any country, uh, and they're just north of, um, you know, north of Nicaragua. Uh, so, and, and actually, you know, what's going on right now is, you know, the Peruvians and the Colombians pushed a lot of the drug stuff into the Caribbean and into Mexico, and the Mexicans are squeezing it out, and now it's all going into Central America. And so there's actually a lot of, you know, drug cartels and, and other really bad uh, types uh, that, you know, in theory would benefit from a more open uh, border, okay? Uh, Health and agriculture, what, what's their view on this? Uh, Do they have much of a... Some sanitation and the, uh, some services to... Uh, services, to yeah. Is corruption right. going to be a problem in either yes, of these ministries, yeah. right? Because yes, they will the damaged the product maybe will, will not allow yeah. to enter to the country. Yeah, I mean, this is another classic form of corruption. So all of these ministries have got to put their stamp, you know, on the papers of the <laughs> trucks going through. And in order to get that stamp, you know, it takes a long time. You're waiting online. And so a little bit of money will expedite that, right? And so these people also lose money making. that are really hard mm -hmm. to resist, but resist. you know what what is it that determines actually what what price you know you're you're bribable at salary and personal compensation. Well, it says that at 
that there is this, this uh, theory, I don't know who's it, that says that the human behavior is ruled by three forces. Mm -hmm. Law, uh, moral values, and mm -hmm. moral, uh, I don't yes. know, yeah, morality. Mm -hmm. And the other one is culture. So yeah. then in this time, in this moment, maybe you don't have a very good values, and maybe law is tricky, but then it, the, the, the social, the social uh, okay. pressure is strong. Okay, so and actually Eric was talking it. about this, remember when he, in his first lecture on Monday, he was saying, well, what is law? And so part of law are the formal rules that exist on statute books that the Congress has passed and, and, and so forth. But part of them are these informal uh, yes. rules that, that have to do with actually whether people uh, obey laws. Uh, and then a lot of it is cultural rules, you know, things that you see uh, around you. So again, let's think about, so put aside the values for the time being, just in terms of incentives. Uh, in order to get laws enforced, what, what kind of a structure do you need? What kind of institutional structure? Security services, please. Yeah, okay, so what is the law? So the law breaks down institutionally into a lot of different components. You need a court system, uh, you need judges, you need lawyers, you need a bar association, uh, and you need police and you need enforcement, right? Frontier. And obviously, uh, if there's like an anti-corruption agency, I don't know whether Nicaragua, uh, whether Costa Rica has one, but clearly people are not watching, you know, a lot of the government officials up in this up in this border area. So, you know, that's something that you, you know, if you actually started putting a few of these people in jail, mm -hmm. uh, a yeah. number of you have mentioned that the failure of politicians to go to jail, you know, encourages further corruption. And so enforcement, you know, is something that you can actually invest in, in enforcement uh, capacity. Uh, what about the more informal kinds of norms? Like, or let me put this differently. Is there something Future about... Future elections could help you out. Coming mm -hmm. elections could push you out yeah, to okay. do more uh, All right, so, th okay, that's a good point. So let's think about the, the political leadership in Costa Rica. Does anyone have an incentive to get up and say, uh, I think we should have an inefficient border where local customs officials take bribes? No. Mm -hmm. Obviously no, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, and in fact, Laura Chinchilla, as we said, probably has a strong incentive actually to clean up and, and, and fix this problem. Probably so does Mr. Ocampo. What about other political actors? They will make the local excuses. Mm -hmm. They will make excuses, but would not and want the, the opposition says. leaders would not want the system to become efficient. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you have a really poisonous political culture in mm -hmm. which the opposition regards, you know, political combat as a zero-sum game where if the country does better under your, the opposing party, then you're, you're against that. Yes, that, that, that will happen, uh, but uh, yeah. yeah. I think that most of the people at, the, uh, at that particular site are the ones who want to keep, the, the thing, to want to keep things the way they are, mm -hmm. but people at higher ups, you know, the police commissioner or the ministries, I think they want to fix things. Everybody wants to fix things, mm -hmm. but maybe the guys who benefit mm -hmm. are the ones who want this. Yeah, to it. so that's a complicated thing. So in a little customs issue like this, it's probably the case that the much higher up politicians have no particular incentive to let this go on, and they'd like to clean it up. On the other hand, if you're talking about bringing in fighter jets in which you're getting a $200 million rake off from some really big defense purchase, if you're the defense minister, you know, maybe, you know, maybe that's, you know, it'll make it, uh, make, it'll make it worthwhile. So I think the, the kind of scale of, of the transaction also makes a difference. But certainly in something kind of small like this, probably the more higher up people uh, are not going to, uh, you know, it, it's not going to be um, uh, in their interest to, to permit it to happen. Yeah. Again, I think there could be some connection between the governance and the at the, at the top level and the people electorate there. Mm -hmm. Maybe the people are happy that this is happening and they're making money out of it. And the people on the top to be elected, these people will be voting for them. Mm -hmm. So they might only say, please do not do that. Mm -hmm. and don't go ahead with that. We are happy with this. We are making money. And this is how those people there would be surviving. Mm -hmm. So that again, at the same time, maybe the top level to say that they would have no incentive to yeah. not to change it. Is also you know, actually, so this is an example of where <coughs> Larry's discussion about electoral systems 
probably makes a difference, right? Because, and I actually don't know in Costa Rica what the electoral system for Congress is, whether you've got single member uh, kind of district. local districts. I, I'll look it up. Yeah, okay. Larry, <laughs> while Larry is looking that up, uh, which kind of system, so you know, you can have a proportional representation system where the whole country is just one electoral <coughs> district. That's what they do in Israel and in Holland and certain other relatively small countries versus one where local representatives are, are elected in, in small districts. So which one of those systems would actually be better from the standpoint of dealing with a... Proportional. The proportional, proportional one, right? Yeah. So if elections are fought by national parties over kind of national interest issues, then you're not going to have uh, uh, very concentrated groups of people that will defend a local interest like the interests of all the people up at this customs post, right? So Those list proportional representation. <laughs> okay, so, Sorry? and it's a, and, and so, it, and, and the district, the whole country is one district? Seven constituencies. Okay, well, so actually, so if Costa Rica actually has this kind of system. Seven constituencies, seven constituencies yes. Corresponding to the province. Seven, okay, so seven, so there is some. So it's possible that, I don't know where the province boundaries are in Costa Rica, so it is possible that that province up by the border, uh, you know, it, lo it, it elects officials that would have a strong interest in keeping things the way they are. Uh, and then you get into these other issues in constitutional design, how much power do you give uh, minorities to block things uh, in, in the government? Uh, in the United States, we've got a checks and balances system that uh, gives a lot of power to, you know, to minorities. And as we were saying in the general discussion about constitutional design, in a democracy, you don't want majorities simply to be able to steamroll over minorities, right? In ethnic disputes and a lot of other things. But that same power to block the majority from doing things in a case like this has a very negative impact, right? Because you actually, it's, it's in the national interest of the country to open up this border, but there's a small concentrated group of people who are self-interested in keeping this dysfunctional system uh, going. And so this, I think, is actually a case where the design of the electoral districts and, and you know, the different constitutional powers accorded Congress versus the president. You know, for example, in some countries, presidents in trade issues are given special powers to actually, you know, enact legislation precisely to avoid this kind of localism in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in, in the legislature. And in fact, in the United States, the only way that we ever negotiated NAFTA or the GATT or any of these big trade agreements was through something called fast track trade authority in which basically all 535 members of Congress agreed that they would give up their ability to offer separate amendments uh, to protect their local constituents in a big trade negotiation and that the trade negotiator would make all the trade-offs and then would take the bill to um, Congress in a single up or down vote so that either you vote for NAFTA or you vote against it but you can't say well I'll vote for it as long as you exempt sugar you know, or, or you, you, you give a special subsidy to, you know, to Iowa corn or something like that, all right? So here's an example where actually the design of the system makes a difference in your ability to pursue things in, uh, in the national interest. Okay, so. Wait, 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 but there's yeah. something else with the bureaucratic, yeah. bureaucracies, is the inertia. The inertia. The change, yeah. and there are probably also budget wars. If they improve, their skills and mm -hmm. their, they reduce their timelines and so on, they're going to lose money. Mm -hmm. And probably some of the agents will be expelled off. Mm -hmm. So probably also the labor unions will be against this. True. Right, yes. right. And I suspect in Costa Rica, the public sector workers are probably all unionized because it's a very union-friendly uh, country where it's, I imagine, pretty difficult to actually fire people. Nidal? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit confused in measuring the, the magnitude of influence of this conflicting uh, uh, interest. So do you think that officials at border posts and very, loc very local uh, economy, that would have ma 
much magnitude to uh, to resist such, I mean, border reforms and all of that? Well, I think that it is, uh, I don't know enough about uh, Costa Rican politics to tell you that yes, they actually did, you know, make speeches in Congress and, you know, do this and that. I know, however, this problem has not been fixed, <coughs> despite the commitment of the president and her minister to try to fix it. This case was written, I think, about two years ago. Uh, and actually, it's interesting. The last, well, actually, the last time I taught this, I taught this in Burma, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is why the last study question tries to compare to Costa Rica Myanmar. to Burma. So you should just ignore that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also taught it in Costa Rica. We taught it at Incai, this business school in San Jose. And it was really interesting because I would say that you know, half the students came from Central America and the other half came from other parts of Latin America. Mm -hmm. And I would say that there is not a single student in that audience that thought that this problem was fixable. <laughs> oh, um, why? Uh, no, you know, I, I, I think that it's fixable, but um, government or head of the country has to have a, like a responsibility that he should be like uh, ready not to elect it in the second mm -hmm. time, but he has to done these reforms today. And the reform process is not easy. <laughs> Even you, you can go to pass away. So just okay, <laughs> so maybe we should. <laughs> can I add yeah, one thing? Go ahead. I think that just uh, for, uh, for Costa Rica, probably it's more than just the borders. They want to have, uh, yani they, should, they should change the whole politics with all their, na their neighbors, and they're afraid of that. They're afraid of war, they're afraid of maybe goods coming in, so mm -hmm. there's ma many things. But I think reading the case doesn't seem to me that uh, it's perfect in, uh, in the borders. I think that the resident living around are not happy with that. Mm -hmm. There is prostitution, there is like um, Crime, uh, drugs, yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of things. And I think also they are a stakeholder in maybe pushing their, uh, their, their local maybe electors in a way or another to okay. find a solution okay. for that. All right, so, so this is now the meat of where we, I hope to get to in this case because a lot of the analysis of poor governance and corruption, it just says, okay, it's bad. We've now done this regression that shows it produces inefficiency. This is the... We can actually identify that this is the cause of it, you know, and, and, and so forth. But they don't actually tell you, uh, okay, so what is the next step as a practical matter? You want to fix this problem. You want to increase economic output in Costa Rica. You've got this clear-cut policy that you are pretty sure is going to increase your country's rate of growth. Uh, and you want to fix the problem. And so how do you go about fixing the problem if you are a political leader like Mr. Ocampo or President Chinchilla, okay? First of all, you have a political will to do this. Yeah? Okay, so I kind of don't like the word political will Bill. because <laughs> it kind of assumes, it, it, you know, the metaphor is sort of like with exercising. <laughs> you know, like I'm really a fat slob and I know that I should be on the treadmill every morning <laughs> you know, running, and I get up in the morning and I say, ah, you know, <laughs> I really like lying here in my bed. I want to have a nice breakfast. And then after <laughs> breakfast, I'm too full to actually get on the treadmill and you know, <laughs> so forth. And so the political will <laughs> metaphor is, is, it sort of makes you think, yeah, no, you just got to get up in the morning and say, I'm really going to do this. You know, <laughs> and today I'm really going to get on my exercise bike and go, you know, 25 miles, all right? But, so maybe what we should do is when people say political will, what do we mean by political will? Yeah. I mean, how do you generate the money, equivalent of money getting on the- Money allocation is very important for political will. I'm sorry, what is? Money allocation is, is, is crucial for political will. You could money have allocation, yeah, just, just say, that Laura Chinchilla could say every day, we have to fix this, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't put, if she doesn't put some money or some directly responsible, then that won't happen. Okay. Although I she think dreams Okay, so let's let's that. talk about specifically you are Laura Chinchilla and you want to um, well, okay, maybe we should take it down a notch. You're Mr. Ocampo because I don't know, maybe some of you will end up president one day. Um, <laughs> but but let's start with the minister. So you're Mr. Ocampo. You're trying to advise the president on a strategy of how to fix this problem. 
and you want to have, we want Mr. Ocampo to have lots of political will. So personally, as an individual, he's got lots of will. He gets up and says, okay, I'm, he's gonna do the um, best darn job I can as commerce minister, but what does he then do? You know, we've been getting towards this, right? So what, what does that mean in practical terms that you try to do in order to help your president fix this problem? Yeah, he, uh, the first thing I would do is uh, uh, make sure uh, the, the, the procedures and the laws are followed and, and are, are clear and you streamline all those different okay. government institutions. So you've got a lot of help, right? So that was our list that we wrote here, right? So these are things that I would say are kind of technical kinds of fixes to this problem, okay? And I think that's actually sort of the easy part because You've got all of these external consultants, you know, you've got the IDB and the World Bank and all of these agencies that will help you come up with this list of things to do. It's got a price tag, you know, anywhere from 16 to 47 million dollars, right? Uh, so part of it is then saying, okay, I am willing to make this a priority and I'll spend, you know, whatever amount of money, you know, with the attendant risks. Okay, so that's part of it. but. Uh, neither Mr. Ocampo nor the president of Costa Rica, you know, are like Kim Jong-un. I mean, they're not dictators, <laughs> right? They, they work in a democratic uh, context, and so they can't just unilaterally decide, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to move ahead with this. Particularly, can you do all of this thing just out of <coughs> the office of the president? No. 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 No, I mean, mobilization. Yeah, you, you need, you need, first of all, you need, Congress has got to back this because it's going to have to put resources into this. You're probably going to have to change a number of laws in order to get some of these, especially the ones that are increasing the coordination and the procedures. You know, you're going to run up against, you know, public sector, the unions aren't going to like changing their procedures and, and this sort of thing. And so you're going to have to get cooperation <coughs> from a lot of different people. Yeah, they're on. I just wanted to say that politicians are never involved if mm. they don't see the political gain mm -hmm. of their action. So Not I that think. True. And generally. Yeah, generally, I don't think so. if they don't see a direct I political so. gain, I don't see the politicians being well, involved. Well, okay, but, but what? No, no, but we. Hmm? But I thought, I thought we actually address that. So the president, we, I thought we said, actually does have an incentive yeah. Yeah. because if she can fix this problem, the economy is going to grow faster than it would have otherwise. And people are presumably going to be happier about voting. Well, it's only a one-term presidency, so she can't get reelected, but her party will do and better. she's gaining something from it. She's that. gaining something yeah, from that's it. Yeah. Political yeah. Yeah. yeah, so she's got an incentive. But we're talking about, so she's got this incentive, but she can't just unilaterally make the decision. So how do you get so what is political will in this case? I mean, how do you get, get there? Yeah. I, I, I mean, just like you said, just if she has an incentive, she, uh, to, go for, to go ahead with her performance, you have to make sure that everyone has an incentive. So I don't know how okay. you could change the incentives of the local Okay, the local so community. let's talk about that. I mean, because this is absolutely the way you have to proceed. So you, you start sometimes. mobilizing people. Some, sometimes. You start mobilizing. <laughs> yes, you, you start mobilizing campaign. people through different uh, mm -hmm. social media or other media instruments. Okay. Um, First of all. If we go back to this, but then you are going to be called, uh, 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 so populist. we didn't finish Not this really. whole list, Not but really. there are people in Costa Rica, right, that will benefit from this kind of change, right? So when you say you mobilize people, you would clearly start with those particular groups that directly are going to benefit from syndicates, for example. Yeah. yeah. You need and some then, public okay. awareness campaign to show the people why it's so bad. Okay, so <laughs> communications <laughs> is really <laughs> important, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I actually, <laughs> I actually would fall. Yeah. I, I voted for President Obama, but I would say that I am very disappointed with him as a communicator because I just don't feel that he adequately communicates why his own policies are, you know, are good. Whereas I think if you look back in American history, you know, people like Franklin Delano Roosevelt or Ronald Reagan, I mean, these really great presidents, uh, they weren't great as technocrats. You know, they didn't come up with, you know, well, we need to double the size of the highway. Uh, this sort of, that was Jimmy Carter that did that kind of stuff. What they were good at was communicating, you know, and they could, 
explain to people in very simple language why they'd be better off, you know. Uh, and in fact, you know, Clinton administration, I remember watching Al Gore debate Ross Perot about NAFTA, you know, and you gotta <coughs> engage in, in, you know, that kind of communications if you're gonna convince people. Uh, and, and this is even true in a, you know, in a, in a quasi-authoritarian country because even in authoritarian countries, it's not always the case that the government can simply, you know, do what it wants. It's got entrenched corruption and agents that won't, you know, follow orders and, and, and so forth, right? So, so you need to communicate mm -hmm. and you need to basically build a coalition, right? Of supporters. You got to build a coalition. If you don't have supporters, no, you know, president can't do it on her own. And the American president, in fact, we actually have a pretty weak presidency. If you don't have a majority in both houses of Congress, and even when you do have a majority, you can't always get your own party members, you know, to, you know, to vote with you, right? And so part of the, you know, part of what we're saying is political will is this ability to mobilize this coalition. Um, what about, so somebody said social media. I mean. Mainstream media is also, <coughs> it's, it's, it's very powerful nowadays. Right. It's one of the most powerful instruments to communicate. And, and actually, you know, there's, there's even other stuff that can be done. Like, so in Colombia, right, the uh, FARC has caused a lot of trouble in this country, and there's been mobilization of just big demonstrations against, you know, violence. And, and it's very powerful when, when people see that there's, you know, half a million people in the streets of, I mean, I doubt that you can get half a million people to protest about Peñas Blancas, but, <laughs> but you know, the, the basic idea is that uh, political support is, is not something that just is lying around like, you know, apples under an apple tree that you just pick up. Uh, sometimes you actually have to cultivate it, you know, you, you have to kind of grow the apples, uh, and that takes a kind of proactive uh, effort, and this is kind of one of the problems in, in a lot of um, political science these days that they just assume, you know, the political scientists assume that these interests are just there and they're all fixed uh, and the political system just processes these interests. But a lot of times the politicians themselves explain to people what their interests are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not obvious that free trade is a good thing for you unless someone is actually explaining what the benefits are going to be, right? Okay, so that's part of the that's part of the political story. Now, how about dealing with these people? And, and so this is a typical case where maybe every consumer in Costa Rica will have some small Games. advantage that they'll get if this border is opened up. Maybe their milk will get less expensive, you know, or something. Mm -hmm. But what about these people down here? You have what, to, what's the nature of their interests? You have to create a strategy to compensate them for the cost yeah, they are yeah. going to have. And, and they are much more self-interested than these groups. Well, I know, maybe the exporters are, are very, they have concentrated interest. But consumers, you know, yeah. I mean. They don't have it yet, so they don't really care. So. Yeah, and plus which, it's the whole country. And how do you mobilize the entire population of the country be, behind something like this? Whereas. You know, the, the warehouse owners and the customs brokers and the tramitadores, all of these people that are profiting from the system, if the system changes, they're out of a job, you know? They, they've lost their, their livelihoods, right? And so I guess if you are in a really authoritarian country, um, you can just arrest them or, you know, <laughs> round them up and move them to Xinjiang or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but. You can't, uh, you can't do this in, in, in Costa Rica, so you gotta come up with a different strategy for neutralizing them. So yeah. what can we do? You need to, in, to invite foreign advisors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> PR consultants. Well, okay, so. Negotiate no, but no, serious, no, let's stay with this question about the foreign the advisors for the yeah. time being, because one Could thing that's characteristic of the world today is that nobody lives in this sealed national community, yeah. right? And so you've got all of these, you know, banks and allies and, you know, other forces. Civil society, you know, is, is transnational and so forth. So can, how, do you, how do you make use of that if you want to build this coalition and if you want to neutralize these people? Yeah. I mean, if you talk about, visit, I mean, international organizations have a lot of programs about local businesses and about mayor. I'm not sure how effective they are about how making them more increase the opportunities to export and all of that mm -hmm. and 
increase their efficiency. But the problem it takes on a, on a, I don't think it's going to be a short-term thing. Yeah. But, you know, in, in a certain sense, if you're trying to build a political case and you can say that, you know, we've consulted all of these experts and, or even better, you know, if one of your neighbors has done a similar kind of reform and they've use actually... Use the weight, in a sense. Hmm? Use the weight, the yeah. weight of... Yeah, you can use the weight of international expertise, you know, you can say, you know, some of the best economists have come and they've looked at our problem and they can say that we're... Can use World Bank uh, support to compensate some money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, well, the World Bank will not give you a loan to pay bribes or to, I mean, they used to, but, <laughs> but they, <laughs> they, they, they won't explicitly give you money. Okay, so if we're talking about how do we deal with this group of people. Yeah, you, you can give more create local subsidies. foundation to support this group of people. You Maybe tax it. exemption I mean, for the local business. Taxation can be changed, subsidies can be provided to some yeah. of them, or, I mean, it's... But do okay, you really, so, but yeah. I have a question there because <coughs> I don't think that you have to compensate everyone that loses from a, a public decision because then at any public decision somebody is going to lose. Mm -hmm. And then what's happened? I think that what it has to be done is just to make these people to understand even though that they are losing, yeah. there is a bigger earn from yeah. most of the people because yeah. then no, that's right. everyone so is going to be and losing in fact, some, some, some if somehow. you pay too much compensation, mm -hmm. you can actually create a bigger problem than so you I started think. with, right? So. They would uh, want to settle it. They would want to take more and more. Yeah, they want to take more and more. And, and, and actually down the road, the compensation you're paying may come back to haunt. Like Larry was saying that you got this Brazilian political system where you don't have strong big parties and they solved it through coalitions. Well, they sort of solved it through coalitions because in order to get some of these legislatures, legislators on board, they basically have to offer, you know, a lot of individual payoffs, you know, in order to get them to support the, uh, you know, the president's uh, agenda, and so uh, it's a pretty tricky, it's a pretty tricky issue. And you're right that not everybody is is going to um, uh, ultimately get on board, and not everybody in, is going to be happy with the Don't final decision. But in this political system, basically, you got to get to a majority in Congress or whatever the, you know. The threshold is in order to, you know, in order to make the change. Yeah, Sultan. Um, oh, you could also uh, use maybe political incentives. Obviously, the, some of these uh, businessmen uh, <laughs> might have political <laughs> ambitions, so you could uh, entice oh. them by appointing someone somewhere. Yeah, you could make them a candidate, you know, for a seat in your. Oh, you just to create party. a liberal environment for them to functioning. I think so, and it, in future it will work. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes. Um, two things. One, that these people usually show their resistance indirectly, and they do not oppose the project, but they, they kind of create other other problems. And secondly, it sometimes helps to make a win-win argument, yeah. to phrase it that way. Yeah. Uh, no, but for the industries that are losing their jobs, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to uh, tell them that you know it's very good that others would benefit. So well, you, you know, what really happened, what happened in, to be let's say, the NAFTA, the NAFTA negotiation, the some cases, you sure? North American free trade uh, agreement with Mexico and Canada that was negotiated in, in the 1980s and 90s, you know, the American labor unions were really dead set against this agreement because they didn't want competition from, uh, you know, Mexican, basically Mexican uh, workers. And the side payment that was made in order to get NAFTA passed was not overt compensation. Basically, it was promises of worker retraining. You know that if people lost their jobs, they would, uh, uh, you know, they would get trained for higher skill occupations where they wouldn't be competing directly with Mexican uh, workers. Now, <laughs> one of the reasons that the American unions, the AFL-CIO, really doesn't want any more free trade agreements is that they feel that the government actually didn't follow through on that commitment and, and actually they just continue to, you know, to lose jobs. So it's, it's complicated, but there, you know, the, the payoff, <laughs> payoff doesn't make a, it doesn't have a nice sound, but there are actually perfectly respectable ways in which you can persuade people, uh, you know, to go along with your, you know, with your plan. A lot of times it requires an investment of resources, but, you know, but there are ways of doing it. Yeah, Emmanuel. 
Well, I was thinking apart from the people who run about in bicycles, mm -hmm. actually the rest of the people at the border might actually benefit because mm -hmm. if you build the warehouses inward mm -hmm. and if there's a lot of flow of traffic, mm -hmm. most probably the the trucks will need somewhere to spend. Yeah, no, because there's so many which yeah. right. move about and then they, they, uh, the brokers themselves, mm -hmm. if they can actually be part of this larger coordination and computerization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not not everyone wants to go and uh, fill these forms. You'll still need brokers, but in a more yeah. effective so way, but inward true. maybe not at the border because what you're trying to control is the, and, and in fact, is you know, the traffic. You, you could link this whole initiative to an urban redevelopment plan for the city itself. Yeah. And you say, yes. mm. look, everybody's been making money off of you know, basically these corrupt sources. Mm. But actually, since all this traffic is gonna be passing through here, we need hotels, we yep. need restaurants, yeah. we need facilities, you know, warehouses. Mm. There's a lot of legitimate businesses that will facilitate a high volume of, you know, goods change. flowing through here. You and you can make your money the honest way, yes. you know? And in fact, you could make a lot more money mm. that mm -hmm. way than, than simply- You have to show the people that what will be the economic rate of return after, after yeah. you implement this program to the- Now, if you're Laura Chinchilla, it would probably be helpful to have a local ally. Like if you yes. had a, yeah. you know, a local mayor or the governor of the province or somebody that was actually close to the constituents that you know, are affected, and then they had a kind of big vision for transforming the entire economy of the area, you know, along these lines uh, that may, you know, make some of these opponents um, less, uh, you know, less opposed. Uh, so I guess this is, um, th there's no postscript. Usually in these cases, we have a postscript that tells you how this whole thing came out. Uh, the only thing I know is that they haven't fixed this problem yet. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, there was. A got, I read that they got 80 million from IDB for, mm -hmm. the, yeah. for this. Yeah, yeah. It, it says somewhere. But but that doesn't tell you actually yeah, whether they're going to fix the problem or not, <laughs> right? And actually, if you look at these numbers, uh, eight million dollars. Eighty, eighty. Oh, eighty million. 80 oh, million okay, dollars. okay, okay. Yeah, all right. So uh, they decided to go big. So we. So then we'll have to see whether they can actually spend eighty million dollars mm -hmm. uh, uh, effectively. Emmanuel. <laughs> well, in, in the whole scenario, I think um, you can actually divide certain uh, activities in a uh, short, medium, and long term. Because whatever you do, and if you don't ne negotiate with mm -hmm. Nicaragua to be more effective, which you don't know how long it will be, mm -hmm. then actually you are not solving the problem. Um, we had the uh, same scenario in East Africa because we are in a, right. in a common right. market. And um, ultimately, what was agreed with states after so much negotiation was that actually what you need is, a, is, is one border post at the border. Because if you can just convince Nicaragua to allow the officials to be part of the border post, mm -hmm. then the traffic will move much more right. fast. And they, will, right. and they will not actually invest anything because you are building your own systems and you are allowing them to come and uh, do the inspections there. And mm -hmm. uh, things mm -hmm. will be much more faster yeah. when you're yeah. trying to negotiate with them how to expand the infrastructure. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's basically why the San Diego-Tijuana border mm. works because on both sides, mm. Mexico and the United States, you know, you have DEA agents that work on the Mexican side of the border and, you know, yeah, Mexican yeah, customs yeah. that work in the American side and, uh, so forth to you know to facilitate that. Um, okay, so um, so I guess what's the point of this case? <laughs> Thing about a case is that there is no right answer. You know, uh, there's no clear outcome that I'm trying to lead you to, except uh, as a general way of thinking about the relationship of politics and governance and institutions to economic outcomes, because here you can pretty clearly see why weak institutions and weak governance hurts, you know, economic growth, right? Mm. And that if you fix these problems, you can make your country better, but how do you get to fixing them? And the answer is largely politics. And actually, one thing I, I disagreed with in the last uh, 
presentation a little bit was this focus on bureaucrats that you know the bureaucrats are the problems that, that create you know that they're the ones that are taking bribes and so forth uh, I think uh, that almost every major problem of corruption can be traced to a politician rather than a bureaucrat because it's, it's the politicians that set the rules under which the bureaucrats uh, operate and you know, if the polit and, and, and a lot of times the people that are actually uh, taking the money and, and doing the bad stuff uh, are not the lowly customs agents, but it's the people that, you know, sit in the political layer above them. And unless you get that relationship right, you know, because at least here we're kind of presuming that the president of the country wants to do the right thing, but there are a lot of countries where the president is basically the biggest crook of all, you know, or they've got a lot of, um, they've got a lot of personal uh, interests and, 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 and so forth. And I think the better authoritarian countries, uh, you know, uh, places like Singapore and, and China, part of the reason that they're successful is that, you know, there's at least some adult control at the very top of the system so that, you know, somebody wants to crack down on this kind of bad behavior at lower levels. But if you know, if the deep corruption goes all the way to the top of the government, then I would say move to another country for the time being and just hope that something happens, <laughs> uh, you know, that or, or join the underground or, you know, get the president <laughs> out of there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, because, you know, you're, you're probably not going to be able to fix things at, at, at lower levels. Um, but again, just to get back to this, I didn't mean to jump on you about political will, but when we talk about something like political will, it's not like individual will. It is, it's basically what we call politics, right? It's, and what is politics about? Politics is about the exercise of power. How do you get power? You get it by building coalitions, by getting people to support you, by communicating your point of view, and then by doing something to neutralize people that you can't convince. That's what all politicians everywhere in the world do. And, democratic countries and in authoritarian ones, right? Uh, and so I think that when you talk about how do you actually practically, as a practical matter, deal with a, a, a governance obstacle to good economic performance, if you don't think politically, you know, kind of from the start, you're gonna miss a lot. And this is one of the big problems with a lot of the development banks, that they all start with this list. You know, they start with the technical fixes. And, you know, these development banks love computers. So first answer to any problem <laughs> is computerize the court system and computerize, you know, the customs and all of that. And, you know, they install these beautiful new computerized systems and the problem is still there. Reason that it's still there is because of these people. <laughs> you know, that you've got all these entrenched actors that are politically powerful the international institutions has no, they have no direct impact on the incentives of people that want to keep things the way they are. Uh, and therefore, uh, doing all this stuff in the absence of having a strategy to fix these sets of problems is not going to work. And actually, it's interesting, the World Bank got religion on good governance and corruption in the in the mid 1990s because prior to that you know the Washington consensus was the the dominant message coming out of all these uh, uh, international institutions that you want to cut back the size of the state deregulate privatize so on and so forth and then Russia happens you know where you you get dominance of these oligarchs and mafias and so forth or you get you know, very bad outcomes in, you know, many other parts of the world. And then all of a sudden people say, hey, you know, we actually need a state. You know, we, we, if you don't have a state that's going to provide order, security, property rights, a court system, uh, provide education, health, you know, all of these other things, then the economic good outcomes that we're hoping for aren't going to work. And so the bank uh, under Jim Wolfenson uh, in the mid-90s began talking overtly about corruption uh, and good governance and they created you know a large part of the bank that that deals with this uh, this set of issues and it was very interesting after 10 years of doing this and something like 37 percent 
of all of the banks lending uh, in this period was, they said, related to public sector reform. Uh, when they actually tried to measure the impact of all of these programs, it was almost unmeasurable. I mean, <laughs> it, it just, it didn't produce very much. Uh, in certain narrow areas, like in central banks and finance ministries, you know, there's certain, and in health, uh, there are certain areas where that kind of external expert advice was useful. But dealing with large scale corruption, you know, these kinds of issues, almost nothing happened. And the reason that nothing happened was they were paying attention just to this agenda and they weren't paying attention to this. Now, I don't think the bank can actually do very much about this agenda. I mean, this is why these problems have to be fixed by political actors in each country, right? Uh, the outsiders can help, they can give moral support, they can give technical advice, but they cannot create a coalition, you know, a reform coalition. They cannot neutralize, you know, the bad actors. Uh, well, sometimes the United States, you know, offers a dictator a home in New Jersey or something and settles them outside the country. But generally speaking, you know, you have to deal with this in your own country. Uh, and so that's why I think it's been, you know, hard wrestling with this stuff because it is essentially a political, uh, political problem. Uh, so, if there are not any further, so what time are we supposed to end? Uh, 12.30, but you know, there's no law that says we can't have another 10 minutes for lunch. Okay, <laughs> good. Well, you went a long time yesterday, so, uh, so we're actually, I, uh, Serena, am I doing the lecture next or am I doing the Gifford Pin Show next? Monday afternoon. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. All right. So when I do the lecture, I'm going to put this all in a much more abstract and general form. But keep this case in mind, you know, as you think about how the abstract concepts, you know, play out in, in, in real life. Okay. So have a good lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>